really nice to test some of this um, experimentally. So I wonder, for example, the inflation connection with entropy. If we discovered that um, there were patches of the universe that were left from pre-inflation, would that be a problem? Because you know you have your many orders of magnitude that inflation was supposed to, you know, develop, and then it would be hard to imagine there would be weird things left behind. I think that would be fascinating and interesting if we could find in any case, yeah, I mean, as you know, the, we, we heard from, from Anthony Valentini yesterday about the, the anomalies on the larger scale and, and, and Planck, and uh, if, um, and that could maybe more broad, since those larger scales were the, exactly the, the first things that inflation created, and if we see anything weird on the large scales, it's very interesting to look more closely there and see if it can tell you something about inflation having gone on for a very short time or you get any information about pre-inflationary physics. So I think that would be awesome, regardless of whether it sheds light on this or not. Uh, I, I think I understood. Uh, it's, it's very nice, these two laws of uh, uh, increasing and decreasing entropy when you uh, trace environment or uh, conditionalize to the, uh, to the subject. Uh, this is very clear. Um, uh, in fact, it's it's very close to the relational uh, view that I will talk Wonderful. later. <laughs> um, but I didn't understand a word about the inflational how inflation uh, goes uh, plays into that. Um, I, 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 you were very fast there, so I, yeah. I, I suppose I could look at the paper. But um, maybe you could just say a word. Yeah. Uh, as as uh, uh, what I understood has to do with uh, degrees of freedom, Hilbert space is tracing on that, uh, uh, which doesn't seem to have nothing to do whether things become large or small and uh, blows or doesn't blow, don't blow. It seemed to be ir ir irrelevant that. So where, where does it come in, the, the actual? Yeah, so the basic reason, the basic reason I gave, went through it very fast, but because I didn't want to uh, <laughs> upset the very patient chair any further. And, and the, the basic reason it works, the basic reason that long distance correlations help is because what that means is that, if, for example, if you're trying to find out whether you are in an inflationary region or not, if, if this little piece here is in, has inflated, so with very large likelihood have all the ones near it, right? So, so each little bit of information you, you learn about now is no longer telling you something just about what's there. It is also telling you a lot about what's much, much farther away. Or, or to take a solid state example, suppose you have water that's super cooled and half of it is frozen to ice, in, in large swaths. If you look at just one little place and you say, oh, that's frozen, that tells you a lot about the, the surrounding area also. So you learn a lot, you learn about a big region with a lot of bits from just looking at one bit. That's sort of the most intuitive um, explanation I can Shannon, give. Does it violate Shannon result that the amount of entropy uh, decreases exactly by how much you get uh, uh, relative entropy with it? It does not violate. Uh, it's interesting that, the, that you don't get the Sh Shannon's result that you decrease always by the mutual information. And it's easy to see that the result in quantum mechanics has to be more complicated because if you just have two qubits perfectly entangled, right, then the mutual information in classical physics is one bit, but in quantum mechanics you know it's two bits, right? So if, if, if your knowledge about that one other bit if, <laughs> Uh, that you're looking at were to decrease by two bits, then suddenly you would, ha it ha would have an entropy of minus one bit, which it cannot. So quantum mechanics, you can never reduce quite as much as that. But the spirit of Shannon is, is still very much true. You, you find that uh, you, don't, you never get any sort of crazy behavior like this. And, and on average, your entropy does decrease exponentially like this, which I was very surprised when, when, when I got the result. But <coughs> I, the more I think about it, the more I've come to appreciate inflation. There's a quick question about this sort of cosmological entropy problem that um, people sort of latched on too long ago, that the biggest black hole you could fit in the universe would have an entropy of 10 to the 120 and the number of photons is 10 to the 89. And so Penrose had always argued, you know, we're nowhere near the maximum entropy. Right. It all seemed to me that after 1999, that argument doesn't seem correct because when you discover the cosmological constant, let's suppose that's the reason for the acceleration, then you've got a 10 to the 120 uh, entropy tied up with that. And so we're actually very close to that maximum entropy. And there is no entropy gap that Penrose has been arguing. The argument should have changed in 
1999. Do you, I just want. Do you agree with that? Well, I certainly agree with you that that, Pen, that the basic argument Penrose makes is ultimately not correct. Uh, I still feel that there is something left for us to explain because even if we forget about our universe, the entropy in this room could obviously be much higher than it is. You know, we could all be dead right now in heat death, and we're not. <clears throat> so maybe it's not 30 orders of magnitude. Maybe it's only 10 orders of magnitude. But that's um, still a lot more. It still deserves an explanation, and I think inflation provides it very nicely because if you start out with with uh, this picture here, where and bear in mind that what we're actually not creating is just one of these branches, but we're creating all of them, then it doesn't matter if so both Sean Carroll and Roger Penrose basically say that, that um, the problem is that the entropy of the whole thing now will equal the entropy of the whole thing in the beginning. That's what their <coughs> argument hinges on, right? And that inflation doesn't help because it doesn't change anything. I say that's flawed because it's not relevant what the entropy of the total density matrix for all of these branches is right now. What's relevant is the entropy that we have for our branch, when we condition on the fact that we are on this, in this branch here, on this galaxy, and, it, and so on, and that entropy can be completely different from, from this. In fact, the entropy of the whole thing can be zero for all we care, right? And we'll still get a very reasonable entropy there. And the fact that this came out of inflation helps explain then, when you do the math, why the entropy of our branch is so comfortably low that we can have the conversation. I guess the point is that so I think we agree. Yeah, we do. I think we agree. But we can't know. It's un the entropy of the universe is unknowable. You know, and we've no idea whether the entropy of the universe is big or small. We just know about our patch. Yeah, very well put. I actually find it quite remarkable that, that despite being such a big fan of the many worlds, it actually matters remarkably little. Uh, what the overall wave function of everything is, because these two processes of both conditioning and what I know and partial tracing, what I don't care about, uh, actually makes my personal density matrix relatively independent of, of what's out there. And I, I see Carla nodding her head here, so maybe this meeting is going to end in this beautiful harmony and agreement among all of us. <laughs> well, I think the only difference is I don't see that as a reason to deny that there nonetheless is a simple external reality with a, with a wave function. I'm just wondering what the connection is between some of this and the kind of um, relation between decreasing entropy and algorithmic complexity that was, come, that was sort of being talked about in the 90s by Zurich and people. I mean, it seems that if you've got a similar kind of issue, you've got a, you've got a very indeterminate, you know, in the subjective sense, indeterministic process, so I have a reduction of entropy, but there's some increase in complexity that seems to be going with that. Yeah, I, I certainly agree. There are... There are there are, one could have a whole conference on the physics of information uh, where, and discuss the further very deep relationships between these different kinds of uh, roles that information plays and complexity and so on. We, we actually talked about this as, at Wojtek Zurich's birthday conference just a few weeks ago. And coincidentally, I'm organizing a conference on the physics of information for the Foundational Questions Institute. So if, if, the, if this is something that interests you, you know, please let me know about them. I'm interested in it because I think I also have a sense that, that that's why I sort of concluded by saying that information, the universe has, our universe has information kind of written all over it. I think there's a lot more here to under, further understand, which your question is tugging at. Okay, well, thank you on that optimistic note for the future of inquiry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>